that much. I remember kind of sitting around Philip uh, Boyan's kitchen, reading the scenes, and I, you know, I remember there was one scene where we read the um, the big scene uh, at the walls of Erebor, where it's uh, you know me and Bard and up on the and Gandalf, and then up on the walls is you know Richard and the other dwarves and Bilbo Baggins. And I remember being gathered around Philippa's table with Peter Jackson and all the actors and just talking about the scene. You know I mean? Yeah, I remember they, they kind of get you drunk first. <laughs> and then they bring the scene out at the end and you think, oh, this was a rehearsal. And then they ask you, well, what did you think of the scene? And of course, everybody loved it at that point. <laughs> but it was actually the only time we were all doing the scene at the same time because of the way, you know, we shoot a scene so epic as that. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's the first time we're all kind of close together, you know, really working out the characters. Yeah, there's a lot of separation, obviously, through the filming because of the technical processes. So all of those moments, I think they really understood that it was very valuable to come together and kind of build the relationships offset because on set it was going to be incredibly difficult. So uh, you were kind of planting little seeds, you know, like that. Yeah, did you find that you did build this, develop the sense of camaraderie after working on the three films and coming back last year to shoot the additional material? Definitely, and it's been a sort of um, thing that's happened every time we've regathered to to promote the films this year. Especially, it was really, it was really lovely to get back with people that you haven't seen for a year. And so many people came from so many different parts of the world. It was similar to the experience that uh, the dwarves are certainly having in the story, where we can kind of gather and go on a quest together. It really felt like that. So. So nice to see everybody, and, and really, this was the, the final farewell. So uh, yesterday at the premiere in um, in Los Angeles, when you when you hug someone and say uh, goodbye, it really was goodbye. <laughs> yeah, what is the experience like of actually watching the completed movie? Because I'm sure it is a radically different experience than actually that, with the seeing all the visual effects come together. You see a lot of stuff that you never knew was there <laughs> when you were shooting it. Because I remember talking to Pete about the, you know, the army, and I was like, "It's going to be a big army, right?" And he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, it's going to be big. It's going to be like really big, really big army around me." And he's like, "Yeah, it's going to be really big." And then, I, and then I watched the movie back, and it's like ten times bigger than I ever imagined it would be. So there's that kind of treat of, you know, watching these movies after you film them. That is. I just noticed your shirt. Thank you. Um, that it's, it's just so many things you, you never knew to expect. I mean, the bats, the werewolves, the, I mean, they aren't upset with you. <laughs> no? There's no dragon? <laughs> Did you have any questions for Benedict? Um, now, Richard, you had uh, mentioned that the sort of scene where Thorne is really grappling with the dragon sickness and that the beautiful shot of the, speaking of the dragon, the shadow of the dragon slithers across the floor. And that that was something that, that you and Peter kind of collaborated on together. And I'm wondering if you could share that story with us. Yeah, I mean, there were so many moments of experimentation throughout the course of filming, but this was towards the end of the, of the shoot. And in fact, it was in the 20 week pickup period that we had. Um, and it was just a simple stage direction which said, um, Thorne sees his reflection and realizes what he's become. And, Pete had said, I don't really know what to do with this. Do you have any ideas? And I was kind of hoping he'd have all the ideas. So, um, you know, he built uh, like a green ramp with a, with a wall that I could climb and some stunt guys tied ropes around my feet so that they could drag me um, down into the ground. And he said, what music do you want to play? So we played some crazy music, which ended up being the, the soundtrack to Lord of the Rings, which is strange. You know? um, yeah, and then he said, oh, I'm going to build piles of jewels and piles of gold around you digitally. And then seeing the, the final cut of the film where he totally reimagined it and stripped everything away and took it into something really abstract, I felt. I was, you know, it's, it's one of those great moments where you enjoy the collaboration because you, it takes you by surprise. Lee, did you find Peter to be a great collaborator as a filmmaker as well? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, extraordinarily creative person you know he's um, and I, I watched the movie back and there are all these very different actors working on very different characters but we're all in the same movie 
And that's, and it's all in green screen too. So it, it, it's like, that's all Peter's communication with all of us. Wasn't the, um, wasn't the scar uh, something that you collaborated with? Yeah, yeah, I remember being in my kitchen in New York and kind of talking to Philip about, you know, like, the only thing is fought dragons before. He knows how hard they are to kill. Uh, that's, you know, I know how, how dangerous it is to wake up smell. Um, and uh, and we kind of yeah discussed that and kind of came up with the idea of that scar, um, which uh, which I, I really you know the Elven King on the page is you know not the most well developed character in Tolkien's book, but that's never the book that Peter was adapting to the movie. He was you know not working on that draft that was published in 1937. He was working on all of the appendixes, everything that he'd worked on. You know Tolkien had worked on it since the 50s. Um, and um, it makes a much more grown-up film um, than what the Hobbit is. I mean, I find him, you know, Peter Jackson is, um, I mean, I, I could go on about it. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you saw the movie, so I mean, I don't need to say it. This has been a really big year for you. Um, you were also Ronan the Accuser in Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> what the attraction is to playing sort of these grand theatrical figures? I'm pretty boring. You know, right? <laughs> and, uh, no, it's true. <laughs> and I, and I actually really love the opportunity to kind of put on a mask and, um, and, uh, play something very different than myself. And, and, uh, I mean, in all seriousness, like I look at, at the Elven King and I don't, I don't recognize myself. I don't see any of myself in him. Um, and I'm very proud of that because that was the that was the task, really. He's not human. Ronan's not human. Um, and um, I, I don't know. I've just really enjoyed that. Now I, I do a television show as well called Halt and Catch Fire. And, 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 but the, the work there is very different work. It's not about kind of wearing that mask and trying to transform. It's about being you know as honest as I can with the character and approach it in a you know in a very truthful way and revealing way. Um, so and make it look yeah, Richard, you've sort of said that in some ways you, you feel a kinship to Thorin, though, that perhaps the introspection and certain traits that he has are, are ones that you also possess. Yeah, I had to be pretty honest with myself because you do get asked that question a lot, you know, where are you like the character? Um, and most of the time you're looking for big differences in your character, but there are, I'm very stubborn and pig-headed, <laughs> like Thorin. Um, I'm a little bit taller than him. <laughs> and I can grow a beard at an astonishingly kind of weird rate. I once won an award for uh, an unnatural growth of beard when I was with the Royal Shakespeare Company. <laughs> but that's an honest thing. An award? Yeah. Did you a trophy or something like that? <laughs> there was no trophy, but I certainly was the holder of the title. <laughs> Really? Like, I, was, I, was, I was like to hear more about that. Right. Yeah. I was doing um, I was doing the Scottish play on tour, and I decided we, we all had beards, and I decided to shave my beard off one Friday night, and it had grown back by the Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, so now we know the mystery of how you were cast in the role. Right? Well, I was determined. You know, there was so little of. Uh, one's face as a, as a dwarf. There were so many prosthetics and hair and padding, and I just thought, if there's one thing I can do, it's it's have you know a beard and it's my own face, and I can move my mouth around. And there was a lot of shouting and screaming, so I didn't want the beard popping off. Every time. <laughs> <laughs> that was that. Yeah, what is it like to wear those costumes? Because I mean, they're beautiful, but they're very very elaborate. Um, uh, it can be painful. <laughs> um, my the armor I wear in this movie is. But um, uh, it, like I said, it's about it, it's helpful because it helps bring you closer to the character. It helps get you farther away from boring old Lee and closer to you know very interesting thing. Um, so uh, I, I enjoyed it. You know, I just it's look, guys, it's fun to make dress up, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Do you still remember some Elvis? Uh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Would you be so kind as to share that with us? Um, I will. I, I'll say something. But if someone can uh, 
translate it, or know what part of the movie it was set in. Is that, is anyone game for that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 No, it was in the it was in the it was in the second movie. Oh. That's a trick question. <laughs> it is a trick question. I figure at least one or two people in this room have seen the second movie. I knew win the costume competition as well. <laughs> You're asking me for dwarfish now. I'm, I'm not, but um, I do have a good one. Oh, do you? It's very rude. Yes, by all means. And I say it about him. Just kaki ain't go do it. Do you want to know what it means? Yes. I defecate on the heads of your ancestors. <laughs> Philippa Boy, it's not me. <laughs> See, there is going to be a little bit of a dwarf elf rumble. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, on a more serious note, what, what's sort of the, the chief memory that you're taking away from this experience? Like, um, you know, what, how have appearing these movies sort of changed you, either professionally or personally? Um, I would say, I guess, you know, in the lunchtime, you know, because they're, you know, Andy Circus is shooting a unit, Peter Jackson's shooting a unit, people are coming in to rehearse their fights. Like, everyone would gather, like, in the Serengeti, beasts gather at the watering hole. <laughs> and you would kind of see a table full of dwarves, and, you know, Maine Evangeline and Orlando would sit down for a drink. And then Ian McKellen would come in dressed as Gandalf the Grey. And then there would be a bunch of orcs over there, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty incredible, you know. And then the crew, obviously, which is such a huge part of the movie that you don't ever see, uh, but adds so much to the experience you had tonight. Um, <laughs> the, the crew on this movie was, I mean, absolutely top notch. The crew that we worked with on set, the crew that did the digital creations that were not on set. Um, and we all kind of gathered in that lunch tent and um, talked. Sometimes Andy Circus would pull out his saxophone <laughs> this is memorable stuff. <laughs> Actually, mine's very selfish. Um, it, the first day of the location shoot, 